So the most important thing from yesterday was definition of derivatives. So I did a couple examples. You've also done this, I think, in 2.2. Somewhere back in chapter 2, you did problems that you didn't know it, but they were the difference quotient and limit as h approaches 0. So I'm pretty sure you did at least a few of these problems. So this is the definition of derivative. It's a big, important definition that you should memorize. It'll be on a quiz maybe a midterm. We're going to use that definition to get all the rules that if you took a calculus class, you probably remember power rule, product rule, chain rule, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to use this definition right here. So if you watch the video, you saw me make a mistake, but at some point I corrected it. and. Yeah, the derivative. I showed you a different way to compute a left derivative. There are two ways to do a left derivative. Or I should say a right derivative. Yeah. All right, absolute value. We've had a couple absolute value questions. So how do we deal with absolute value? Let's talk about the regular, uh, the most simple absolute value function there is, which is the absolute value of the identity. It's very easy to graph this function. So it's called the, the V graph. It's y equals x on the right side, and on the left side, y equals negative x. That's absolute value. The best way to deal with absolute value is as a step function. So it's either negative x or regular x. It's negative x if x is less than 0, and regular x if x is greater than or equal to 0. So that is how we're going to deal with absolute value functions. We're going to treat them like step functions. And then the part that would have been negative, we just make it positive by putting a negative sign in front. Now it's arbitrary as to if you want to go equals on that side and not equal on this side. It doesn't matter which way you go because that should be on the x-axis right there. So it doesn't matter which side you attach that to. Now if your function is more complicated than just absolute value regular x, so let's say that, uh, let's go with a of x is the absolute value of some g of x function. So you have some function, and then you want to find what does the absolute value look like. It's going to be a step function. So it's regular g of x if g of x was already greater than or equal to 0. And if it was going to be negative, you force it to be positive, and you do it when g of x would have been less than 0. So if g of x is negative, your absolute value is negative g of x. That may look a little weird. Why do we have negative if we're doing absolute value? But if that quantity is negative, you make it positive by just putting an extra negative sign in front or multiplying by a negative 1, however you want to think about it. And it doesn't matter which side has the 0? So, yeah. doesn't matter. Either way, you're going to be on the x-axis at that x value. So those are, those are x-intercepts, so it doesn't matter what one you attach it to. And what if you were to, like, outside of the absolute value add numbers to it or whatever? That gets more complicated. Okay. Uh, then you're going to, that would be a vertical shift up right. or down, if you, if you were going to graph it. You c well, when you say add a number, do you mean? So g absolute value of g of x and then plus 3. And then it would be the exact same thing, but the 0 would be 3, right? The, yeah, there would basically just be a, a plus 3, plus 3 outside. So you make the part I underlined positive not the part I underlined plus 3 positive. <coughs> so 
So let's look at this function right here. What I want to do is pretty boring to ask you for the slope at most x values. So what x value do you think we're going to look at? One. Zero. Look at zero. All the other x values are pretty boring. They're all having slope negative one if we're on the left, positive one if we're on the right. So all the other x values are kind of boring. So we're going to look at right here what happens on both sides. We're going to take one-sided limits at uh, or one-sided derivatives at zero. We'll do, uh, do left derivative first. So there's zero left derivative we need to approach on the negative side or the left side. So x is going to be zero plus h. So h in this case needs to be less than zero or negative. So when we take our limit. How do we, so h is definitely approaching 0, but we want to approach from the negative side. I want h to be a small negative number. And we're using the, um, difference quotient here. And in our case, x is going to equal 0. So I'm going to go ahead and put in zeros for x's. So 0 plus h is just f of h minus f of 0. So we wrote down how to, how to deal with absolute value of x. It's right up here. Absolute value of x is negative x if the input's negative, and regular x if the input is 0 or more. So what is f of 0? It's going to be 0. That's easy. What is f of h? When h is negative. Is that regular h or negative h? So here, h is less than 0. That means we're coming from the left side. <coughs> so it's going to be negative h. Negative h minus 0 is negative h. So we get negative 1. All right, what is this limit? Negative 1. Negative 1. Constant limit is always just that number. Right there. So algebraically, that's what we get with that limit. So this is our left limit, or our slope if we look to the left. H is not 0, H is approaching 0 from the negative side. So it's always equal to 1 or negative 1? Yeah, depending on exactly what side you're on. And also the limit of H as it approaches 0 from the left side, that only affects the F of H and not the H on the bottom? No, it was, they're both the same H. That's why they canceled out. That's why they go to 1. It cancels out to 1. Okay, but wouldn't the H on the bottom also be a negative number then? Yeah. If it's the same age, same, same number. Oh. So that's why it cancels out. Okay. So you <laughs> plug in any quantity for h that's negative, you're going to get negative 1. Oh, okay, okay, I see. How about there? And we get something different when we approach 0 on the, on the other side. Because we're going to use, so we use basically the first piece of this piecewise function. When we approach on the positive side, we're going to be using the second piece. So this function. All right, so that was left derivative. Now we're going to go for the right derivative. Mm -hmm. 
So we're approaching zero from the positive side. So here is zero. We're gonna do zero plus h, so that means h is greater than zero in order to go from the positive side. So f of zero is still zero. And now what is f of h? Is it h or negative h? Well, h is positive, so our absolute value function just gives us back h. So this is going to be just h right here. So I'm using the second piece, the positive one. And this limit's super easy, constant limit now. So limit of one's always one. So the right slope at x equals zero is regular one, or positive one. That better match up with what we see in the graph. So I'm gonna scroll up to the graph right here. So we zoom way in. So we're at x equals zero. If we look to the left, the slope is negative one. If we look to the right, the slope is positive one. So that matches up with our intuition here on the graph. What would I get if I took the regular limit now I'm from both sides? So h could be positive or negative. So we have the full limit, both sides exist if both the one-sided limits agree. But we got negative one and positive one, so they don't agree. So we took a one-sided limit, got negative one, the other side of limit, it got positive one. So they don't match up. So it does not exist because the one-sided limits do not match up. So what does this look like on the graph? So I like to call this a corner point. It's where you make a sharp turn, not a smooth turn. So if you were driving, you couldn't make your car just rotate like that unless you're on ice or something like that or you parked really illegally and they boosted you up on some little rollers and slid your car out. Like your car can't turn like that. That's not a smooth turn. So this corner point right here, if I didn't put such a huge dot right there, maybe I'll take it out now. Oh, that was a lot. All right, good enough. There's a sharp corner right there. So it basically looks like this. There's a corner. So that's what's going on. So the slope doesn't match up. So we call this a corner point. Is this the graph of a continuous function? Yes. So we've got a continuous function, but it doesn't have a derivative at x equals zero. So you're gonna have continuous functions that have corners and they are not gonna be differentiable at that, uh, at that point. So it is continuous, continuous everywhere, of course, but specifically it's continuous at x equals zero, but f of x is not differentiable. So what does differentiable mean? Able to be differentiated, able to take a derivative. So you can't take a derivative at x equals zero. So any continuous function 
if it's not differentiable, the reason it won't be is because it makes these sharp, has these sharp corners somewhere. So there is one more algebra trick that I didn't do in yesterday's lecture. So first of all, we're going to find, with the x squared function, we're going to find f prime of x. So make sure you plug in the x plus h correctly. And then find f prime of x. Lim h approaches 0, f of x plus h minus f of x over h. And I'm going to expand out x plus h squared. So I'm just foiling x squared plus xh plus xh, 2xh's plus h squared. So combine like terms here, simplify it out. Make sure you get rid of the bad guy, which is the h in the denominator. So that one needs to go before you can take the limit, or else you're going to be divided by 0. So this algebra, I've pretty much done all the hard work. Combine like terms, simplify, and you should get a pretty nice function. You do have to factor at some point. So an algebra note, you can cancel the h's, but you better do it really carefully. What I'm going to do is factor out an h, because I got an h and h squared, so factor it out. And now I can go cancel, cancel, and I have 2x plus h. What's that? X squared. No, no, no. Uh, 2x times h. So I, fa I factored an h out, so I get 2xh oh, okay. plus h squared. <clears throat> Alright, this is an easy limit. The bad h is gone. This h that's left is just fine. So this limit's super easy. It's a little bit strange because that part has no h in it, but it still has a variable. The limit doesn't care about the x, though. The limit's just fine. So the only thing the limit applies to is the plus h at the end. So this is going to be 2x plus 0, which is 2x. So that's our f prime function. So if you want to skip some algebra steps because you want to feel fancy, how do you cancel the h's properly? This is how you do it. I see an h and another h and I'm going to cancel the h on the denominator. So if you really want to, the way I would do, do it is you have to pick out an h out of the, both all terms in the top and, can't, and lower, them, lower their powers by 1. So I don't recommend doing this unless you feel very comfortable with the algebra already. <coughs> so the and the x squares would have to be canceled out before that. Too. Yeah. I wouldn't do all this in one move. I mean, I would, but not showing you guys. At, the, at this point, maybe in Calc 2 or 3, I would do that, but not right here. Okay. Yeah, once you get into Calc 2 and 3, we skip lots, lots of algebra. But I try to minimize how much algebra I skip here. 
All right, so we got f and f prime. So now I want you to graph f and f prime. They're easy functions to graph. And I'm going to graph f prime in blue. If you don't have another pen or pencil color, just maybe make one bold, draw over it a couple times, and then make the other one light so you can tell them apart pretty easily. They're easy functions to graph, x squared and 2x. They're super easy to graph. Try to make them pretty accurate. So how are these blue and black functions related? They're related, blue is a derivative of the black one. So this is a weird relationship when you look at it on a graph. What the blue function tells you is the slope of the black function. You're probably looking at the slope of the blue function. Don't do that. So we're going to pick three, the three x values I already have labeled here. Negative 1, 0, positive 1. All right, take a guess at what the slope of the parabola is at negative 1. I could even try to draw the tangent like that. Take a guess at what that slope is. Negative, negative something. Looks like it's steeper than negative 1. What y value do we have on our derivative? We have negative 2. Negative 2 is the slope of the parabola at that point. So f prime of negative 1 is negative 2. This is the slope of the parabola at x equals negative 1. Any questions on that idea? We're going to do the same thing at 1 and uh, 0. So at 0, x equals 0, I'm going to draw a tangent line. So at x equals 0, the tangent line is actually a flat line. If you zoom in far enough, you'll see that I can't draw it right on top of the x-axis, so I'll draw it right next to the x-axis. So there's our tangent right there. Our slope is flat. What y value does our derivative function, our f prime, have? Zero. So don't you're you're gonna have to try to look at the slope of the blue function. Look at the y value of the blue function corresponds to the slope of the black function, and that's really weird to think about. So the y value of the blue function of the derivative is the slope of the original function. <coughs> So we have f prime of 0 equals 0. And this is the slope of our original f of x at x equals 0. Is the uh, derivative always going to be, I guess, a straight line? 
No, uh uh. Definitely not. Okay. I was hoping, but. Nope. Uh, if your derivative is a line, that means your original function is a quadratic. You can see that. And you'll see why relatively soon. From, basically from the power rule. All right, last one. F prime of regular 1 is positive 2. Right up there, that's the other point that I drew. And this is the slope of f of x at x equals regular 1, or positive 1. And I can go up and try to draw that slope in. Right there. It is coincidental that that point happens to be the same slope as the actual blue line had. That's coincidence. Don't read anything more into that. That's the only point on here that has that property. There's a theorem that's sort of like intermediate value theorem called the mean value theorem that tells you this property will exist given some conditions, but generally it won't, it won't uh, happen. All right, so there is our first f and f prime graph together. So in my opinion, this is one of the harder things to think about in calculus, is how is your graph related to the graph of its slope. It's a good midterm or quiz question, though. I'll give you a graph and a slope graph and ask you, do these belong together? Or I could give you a graph and then ask you to draw the slope graph or the derivative graph. What do you mean belong together? Uh, if this graph is, if the black graph is f, is the blue graph f prime? So there's web work questions that make you pair. They'll give you like five functions and five derivative graphs and ask you which, you have to so back, so pair them up. Solve the uh, derivative, the, qu the quotient rule to see if that matches up. Uh, we don't need a quotient rule. <laughs> so we're just okay. looking at slopes. So is a slope, is the slope of the original graph represented by the y values of the derivative graph. All right, I could have done the same thing for any x value. 2, 3, 4, negative 2, 3, 4, or anything in between. So our next theorem. Differentiability implies continuity. Or specifically, if f is differentiable at x, so differentiable or differentiability is too lengthy to write down, too many i's and e's, so I'm just going to write diffable. That's way easier. It's the equivalent of CTS abbreviation. So we'll just write diffable. All right, so written out a different way. If f is diffable at x equals a, then f is continuous at x equals a. And of course, if you're differentiable on an interval, you're differentiable at every point in the interval. And so the same thing would be continuous at every point in the interval. So we just need to show for one uh, x value, if we know we're differentiable, how can we say that we're continuous? What we just saw with the absolute value is the other way around is not true. So we just looked at absolute value function was continuous. It's not differentiable. So continuous does not imply diffable example. We just looked at absolute value of x, we said it was continuous, but we could not take a derivative at x equals 0. So there was a nice continuous function that had a corner. So any continuous function that has sharp edges, not going to be differentiable at those edges. <laughs> so we're going to prove this theorem now. So 
So we're assuming or supposing, I think I've used this half dollar sign before for suppose. So this means suppose F is diffable at X equals A. We want to show F is continuous at X equals A. All right, I'll write down the definition of differentiable. What is the definition of continuous? It's super easy if you know it. Super impossible if you don't. So we got limits match value if I plug it in. So I'm just going to write lim as x approaches a. So that's what we want to show. Limit is the value. Right? That's what it means to be continuous. I'm going to change this limit around a tiny bit. So normally we have a here, and then x is either approaching from one of the two sides, either left or right. It's got to work on both sides. So I can't just assume it's less than a or greater than a. So what I'm going to do is write x is a plus h. And then I'm going to send h to 0. And that will be the same thing as uh, sending uh, x to a. So it's kind of like a neighborhood almost like the deltas. Yep. So this will be the same thing as lim h approaches 0. Oop, now we want a there, not a. So the second one is what we're going to actually show right there. So why did I change it around? Because this is very close to the definition of a derivative right here. So we know our function is differentiable. All right, so we're trying to get down to that right there. So we know f is differentiable at x equals a. So we know the definition. This is f prime of a. And remember, f prime of a is a number. So it's some, some number, because if it's differentiable, that limit has to exist. So it's got to be some number right there. Equals All right, so let's begin. We're going to begin with some algebra. So I don't want to keep writing limit a whole lot of times. So I'm going to do something weird. Oh, it should be A plus H. So why are these equal? So I multiplied and divided by h. So you could ignore those two. They cancel out. I also, whoa, there we go. So the h's will cancel. And I just subtracted f of a and added f of a. So those cancel out also. So algebraically, this is the same thing, as long as h is not 0. I haven't done any limits yet. So we will. And remember, h is not 
non-zero in our limit. No, I meant the F of A plus H minus F of A over H. So algebraically, these are exactly the same thing. It's not super obvious, but the H's cancel. And then the minus F of A plus F of A cancels out also. So I'm just going to rewrite it. All right, so we get this. That's equal as long as h is not 0. Now all we're going to do is treat both sides the same. We're going to apply a limit to both sides. So I'm going to take a limit on the left. Uh, we're going to apply lim h approaches 0 on both sides. So now we're going to use limit rules. One of them is uh, the sum rule. So a limit of this thing plus this other thing, you can do two separate limits. So let's take care of the easy one first. What so the easy one's the one on the right. What is the limit as h approaches 0 of f of something that has no h's in it? 0, a, a, f, a. So is there any h's in here? No. So that means, as far as the limit's concerned, it's constant. It's just a number. So it's just that number right there. It's a little strange. We're not having a limit as a changes. This is a limit as h changes. There's no h in there. Now I'm going to use a product rule. We have h times, oh look at that, that's a difference quotient. So this is going to be lim h approaches 0 of h times lim h approaches 0 So that's the product law for limits. I'm allowed to say limit of this thing times the other thing is a 2, uh, the limit multiplied by the other limit. So that's the uh, product law for limits. Now it's only going to work if both of them have numerical values. What is the first, this is, the left one's super easy. That's going to be the number 0. What is the one on the right? That's less easy. What, did, what was our supposition? The limit exists. The limit of the difference quotient exists. We assumed it was differentiable. So here's where we use that property. Remember, we assumed that it was differentiable, so we knew that this limit right here was a number. So we assumed it was differentiable at A, so if you look at the slope, it was whatever this number is right here. So that's F prime of A. So I'm going to use that fact right here. So it's times F prime of A. Now this is a number. Whatever you get from the derivative, whatever the slope would be. Can't be infinity or negative infinity. It's got to be a number. So what's zero times any number? Zero. Zero. Very good. And what do we start with on the left side? Somewhere. Limit h approaches zero. F of a plus h.
And that's what it means to be continuous. That limit is the value right there. So that's the end of our proof. All right, so we did need the fact that it was differentiable because that meant that difference quotient had a nice value. If I didn't know it was differentiable, that might have been infinity or negative infinity. We would have had problems. Uh, cause it would be like infinity times zero, or zero times infinity, or zero times negative infinity, or zero times undefined. You can't just say that zero, unless you know it's an zero times an actual number. Okay. Then you can say it's zero. So we needed the fact that it was a number. So these are differentiation rules. 3.3. .3. So we're going to do, we're going to create all the rules from the definition of a derivative, our limit laws, and then some algebra as well. So let's do, we'll start on the easiest one, which is a constant function. So what happens if f of x is the number c? No matter what x is, you always get the same number out of your function if it's constant. So it's pretty easy to graph. Here's what it looks like. I don't know if C is positive or negative, so I don't really want to draw a y-axis and an x-axis and assume it's positive or negative. But every constant function has a horizontal line as a graph. All right, what's the slope? What does it look like? Zero. It's not going up, not going down. Flat slope of zero right here. So how do we prove this? You can't just look at the graph and say, ah, definitely zero, no problem. Uh, we're going to prove it. Some nice notation, d over dx means take the derivative. So you're going to see plenty of derivatives written. Uh, d over dx means take the derivative. So this is lim h approaches 0 f of x plus h minus f of x over h. Why do I make you write out the definition of derivative so many times? So you remember it. That's the correct answer. So you remember it, or because I'm cruel. But either way, you'll remember it. All right, what is f of x plus h? That's always the hard part. Our function f of x is c. So what's f of x plus h? C doesn't. This function doesn't care what x, what the input is. It's always going to give you a C. All right, C minus C. Is that one too easy? Apparently, it is too easy. Zero number minus itself. Zero. What's the limit of zero over h? So we're going to do algebra first. What is 0 over h when h is not 0? Zero? 0. zero. Remember, h is approaching 0. h is not equal to 0. So I haven't done any calculus yet. This is all algebra. All right, now, what's the limit of 0 as h approaches anything? 0. zero. So there we go. We could write it as d over dx of a constant. 
equals zero. So there's our first rule right there. So now we'll do some fun algebra. All right, multiply these out. It's not hard to do. We're going to multiply it into the first term first. The whole thing into the first term. So we're going to get xz to the n minus 1. Oh, let's put our x's. Let me write the x's second instead of first. minus z to the n. So we have z to the n minus 1 times another z, boost the power up by 1. So any question on multiplying to the first term? All right, multiplying to the second term right here. So we get plus z to the n minus 2 x squared, because I already had an x, so I boost the power up by 1 for x, minus z to the n minus 1 x. So that's one full term right there. Now I'm multiplying to the third term. All right, you can do the third term. So this looks kind of crazy. So we're going to combine like terms. Do we have a z n minus 1 x match? Yes. What do they add up to? Zero. So we're going to cancel out. Do we have a z n minus 2 x squared? Yes. So they cancel out. Do we have a z n minus 3 x cubed? No. no, but can you see the pattern of what would come next? It's in the dots. It's in the dots. <laughs> so that's going to cancel out with something over here. Uh, there's going to be no other z n, negative z n term. And let's look at the other side. So we can see z x n minus 1 minus z x n minus 1 cancels. And this negative z 2, z n, uh, x to the n minus 
two will cancel out with a term over here in the dots. So what we're left with is x to the n minus z to the n. So this is called difference of n powers. And this is how it factors. You've seen difference of squares. Somewhere along the way, somebody told you about difference of cubes. If you did your homework, one of the web works was like this. Difference of cubes. I can go with difference of fourth powers. Etc. 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 One way to think about it, the sum of the powers is always going to be one less than the powers on the right side. So each of these terms, in this case, has power three, or degree three, I should say. You add up those two powers, and you'll get degree three.